The lessons Uganda learned from the coronavirus pandemic are proving helpful in its approach to the current Ebola outbreak. For now, there's still no vaccine against the virus species, but the East African nation's medical professionals are better prepared. Welcome to the COVID-19 special. How is the Ebola virus different from COVID-19? We talked to virologist Wolfgang Preiser. And what's the difference between a virus strain and a virus variant? But we start the show in Germany, where the latest COVID-19 variants are causing a fresh spike in infection rates. An adapted vaccine targeting Omicron is now available, and one doctor in Berlin is being kept very busy. Here in Berlin's Neukölln district, patients have come to the doctor to get a booster shot. Since the start of the pandemic, they've been flocking to GP Sibylla Katzenstein's practice to get tested and vaccinated. In the early days, the doctor's office was overrun. But now things have calmed down. We make a point of reaching out to patients who are vulnerable and also testing to see if someone has a pre-existing condition. Then we offer them Paxlovid. Elderly patients too. But it's a completely different situation compared to last winter, at least in my practice. Dr. Katzenstein has vaccinated about 20,000 people in her practice. At the moment, the elderly and people with underlying conditions are keen to get boosters and flu shots. But she believes that as winter approaches, the situation calls first and foremost for the right information. People who are vulnerable need to protect themselves. I wear a mask at work to protect my patients and my staff. I'm not sure if government efforts are working. I'm not sure it helps to reintroduce compulsory mask measures indoors every winter. It makes sense in the health sector, in hospitals and doctors and physiotherapy practices, but I don't think the authorities should dictate our every move. In Germany's inner cities, most public health and safety measures have been dropped. But authorities are mulling a reintroduction of restrictions such as mandatory masks indoors. Most people are taking a relaxed approach and more or less stick to the current rules. I'm not worried these days. I just keep to the rules, try to protect myself. I'm vaccinated. I used to be really worried about going shopping. But now I feel pretty safe and I trust that people are protecting themselves and sticking to the rules. I'm kind of worried. We're not out of the woods yet. It's been two years. This is the third winter and it seems like we haven't learned anything. Politicians are now discussing reintroducing safety measures to ensure the healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed. The number of COVID patients in ICUs is currently stable. But as the third COVID winter approaches, hospital staff are feeling the strain. And they're struggling with high infection rates. In the last few weeks, infection rates have gone up among the general public and among doctors and nurses. This puts additional pressure on the system. We've had to reduce the number of available beds because so many are off sick, both in the short term and the long term. Higher energy costs are putting hospitals under further pressure, making it all the more important to avoid another COVID wave this winter. Patients admitted with Omicron tend to have mild cases and are treated on normal wards. But staff shortages mean that some hospitals are already postponing non-emergency surgeries. We have to keep up with emergency operations and emergency care. We have a duty to do so and we're doing that. But we're putting off certain procedures, well, so long as it's safe to do so for the patients. The German healthcare system is understaffed, overstretched and in urgent need of reform. 
This applies to clinics as well as doctors' offices. Sibylla Katzenstein would like to see some big changes. Don't make life harder for healthcare workers than it needs to be. There's too much bureaucracy, and the system is too hierarchical. It's too much. Jobs in healthcare need to be made more attractive if people are going to do them. Rising infection rates are just one of many challenges facing Germany's healthcare system this fall. In the Northern Hemisphere, the third COVID winter is approaching. Let's take a look back at how the global pandemic unfolded. The first year of the pandemic was about unprecedented changes. Streets emptied more or less overnight. Countries all over the world closed borders and locked down. Masking up became compulsory. There were no vaccines, and because healthcare professionals had little experience with the disease, catching it was a terrifying proposition. As the first vaccines were rolled out at the end of that first pandemic year, around 90 million cases of COVID-19 had been reported worldwide. Since then, over seven times that number of people have tested positive for the disease, and experts estimate there have been many, many more unconfirmed cases. At the peak of the Omicron variant surge last January, the highest number of cases in the pandemic so far, over 20 million people worldwide were testing positive for the disease every week. Throughout the pandemic, deaths worldwide, unsurprisingly, have reflected infection worldwide. A series of waves struck the planet. Though different countries suffered differently at different times, a retrospective reveals at least one detectable pattern. It was a simple and devastating equation. When the number of cases rose and fell in a new wave, the number of deaths followed a couple of weeks later. The deadliest wave so far peaked in early 2021, when in one terrible week, over 100,000 people died worldwide. But the equation has changed somewhat since the massive Omicron wave early this year. Large numbers of people are still getting sick, but on average, fewer are dying. The changing relationship between case rates and death tolls is at least in part due to another factor, widespread vaccination. So far, over 12 and a half billion doses of vaccines have gone into arms all over the world. Significant percentages of populations in the Americas, Europe and Asia are now fully vaccinated, though there's still a lot to do in Africa. The biggest vaccination drive in history has not all on its own been enough to stop the continued spread of COVID-19. But coupled with the immunity induced in many people through wide-scale exposure, experts say it's brought the day when we declare the pandemic at an end a lot nearer and save tens of millions of lives. Do you have any questions about COVID-19? Our science correspondent Derek Williams is always up to date with the latest findings and is here to answer them. Just send your questions to covidproducer at dw.com. This week he answers the question, what's the difference between a strain and a variant? This is one of those questions that I get asked pretty frequently because for the general public, the terms strain and variant are often seen as synonyms and, and even some experts seem to sometimes use them interchangeably. So let's start with some background. Um, all viruses evolve over time, which means their genetic code changes during replication as mutations occur. In SARS-CoV-2, those mutations happen fairly frequently compared to some other viruses. Uh, we call these mutated viruses variants uh, because they're different um, genetically and, and sometimes also structurally from their ancestors. Uh, but, but those changes, and, and this is important, 
they don't necessarily cause a variant to behave in really new ways. When those genetic changes lead to new properties in a virus, however, like it begins infecting cells differently, or it becomes much, much more transmissible, then that's when many experts begin talking about new viral strains instead of variants. So strains are always variants, but, but variants aren't always considered strains. Unfortunately, though, there's this kind of muddy place in the middle, which is that naming viruses strains or variants basically boils down to how differently they behave compared to their ancestors, a subjective judgment. Uh, maybe it's easiest to take an example from the macro world to explain it, though it's just a rough approximation. Um, let's look for a second at dogs. Different breeds can be really, really different in terms of their size and their shape and the color of their fur and, and their temperament. But they all have something that I would like to call intrinsically doggy. They're all variations on a common dogginess. And if dog breeds were viruses, then we would call them variants of dogs. Now let's compare dogs to their close evolutionary relatives, wolves. Now here, the behaviors and characteristics really clearly delineate one canine from the other. Uh, wolfness and dogginess are so different that if the two were viruses, we'd call them different strains. Um, they're clearly related, but they not only look different, they behave really differently too. Um, it's not a perfect metaphor, maybe, but maybe a useful one. The Sudan Ebola virus has been spreading rapidly in Uganda in the last few weeks. There are still no approved vaccines against this particular virus species. But thanks to experience gained during the COVID-19 pandemic, the process of identifying and isolating cases is now more efficient than in previous outbreaks. Our reporter Julius Mugambwa visited the village of Madudu, where the virus first surfaced. A grieving father and husband, Maliko Simpewo has lost a son and his wife to Ebola. Health workers are closely monitoring his family. <laughs> They said that we must be under surveillance for at least 21 days, and they often check our temperatures. That period has since passed. Uganda says that its health care system is prepared to cope with Ebola. Central Uganda's Mubende Hospital reported the first confirmed case of Ebola at the end of September. Doctors say that systems set up to fight COVID-19 can also be applied to Ebola. We had not had any earlier experience in handling such epidemics of this level in the country. So the resource population at that time, the training of health workers, and the mobilization of communities was extensively experienced during the time of COVID. That kind of experience has also been drawn over to this Ebola. You have seen that the response this time of partners and by the government is much, much faster. When COVID-19 broke out, Uganda formed a special task force to advise the government. That emergency team has now been redeployed to fight Ebola. One, two, three, four, five. We have the same incident commander uh, who was uh, heading uh, COVID is the one heading Ebola. We have a scientific advisory committee. I'm part of that, uh, that committee. We have a steering committee. We have lab pillar. We have case management pillar. We have surveillance pillar. We have all these pillars under uh, our emergency response. So these are helping. And they are the ones, those we use for COVID now, are being used for Ebola. Before COVID-19, Uganda had only one laboratory that analyzed viruses. The government felt compelled to obtain more diagnostic equipment to deal with COVID-19. Now the laboratory examines Ebola samples on site. It used to take longer, even days, weeks, 
And that was a problem before you intervene. But now quickly we have the labs, you can easily uh, quickly get the results and you intervene. For our test takes about five hours. The moment the sample al arrives in the lab takes five hours. Be but because we need to confirm every sample that is positive, we confirm it and it may take uh, 12, uh, t 10 uh, to 12 hours to finally release the results. The people of Uganda also appear to be more responsive. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, Uganda began local production of medical essentials like protective gear to support health care. Measures such as hand washing are also widespread in the fight against Ebola. I don't shake hands, I don't hug, and I keep washing my, my keeping uh, specific principles of hygiene, like washing hands, washing the body. The measure of prevention, how long I said it is almost the same. During COVID, we were asked to put on masks. That's why even when I'm communicating, I have my own mask. Some challenges that arose during the COVID-19 pandemic remain during the Ebola outbreak. For instance, many frontline health workers still feel underpaid. Minister of Health has not provided a clear compensation plan for the health workers who are dedicated and risking their lives at the front line in this tough battle against Ebola, hemorrhagic uh, virus, a disease with a high fatality rate. We remember we lost over 64 health workers during COVID-19. They were never compensated. The first Ebola case was reported on September 20th in Madudu. Within weeks, the virus spread to a 200-kilometer radius of the village. Even so, the Ugandan government is confident that it can stop Ebola from spreading further, even without imposing travel restrictions. Travel restrictions hit Uganda's economy hard. That's why the country's government is hoping to avoid a renewed ban on non-essential travel at all cost. So far, it looks like such drastic measures won't be necessary. Ebola might be deadlier than COVID, but it appears to be less infectious. How come it hasn't ever spread around the world like COVID-19 did? DW reporter Adrian Griech finds out from South African virologist Wolfgang Preiser. How concerned are you about the situation in Uganda at the moment? Difficult to tell. Um, these um, outbreaks, they start slowly and um, then, you know, one, one has to really watch what, what's happening, in which direction they are moving. Um, what we hear currently is that even Uganda, which is a country with a lot of experience that has done very well in the past uh, with, with outbreaks of, of this kind, is sort of struggling to contain it. So um, hopefully we'll see the, the, the bending of, of the curve, which so far is, is increasing. Uh, with stricter measures having been implemented now, um, but yeah, I'm 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 a bit holding my breath, and and um, so yeah, we'll I think the next few weeks will tell us how how big this is going to get. Can you explain us a little bit what uh, Ebola does in the body? So Ebola is is one of the so-called hemorrhagic fevers. Uh, so the, it manifests with massive bleeding often. Um, after little injuries and injection, for example, but also from, from the, the natural orifices. Uh, and, and that happens because the virus interferes uh, with the liver that produces the clotting factors to, to help our blood clot, uh, but also the cells lining the vessels um, get um, damaged by the viral infection and then the vessels leak out blood. And the, the treacherous thing is that this blood is very infectious. So people carry a lot of virus in their blood and therefore, and this is how transmission usually happens, that you know, bleeding starts and then others rush to help and in the process infect themselves. And if you compare that to SARS-CoV-2? SARS-CoV-2 is really a respiratory tract infection. We know it also has effects on, amongst others, the clotting system in a different way. It, it actually uh, leads to more rather than less clotting, but primarily it's an affliction of the respiratory tract, uh, starting um, in, the, in the upper respiratory tract, that's basically in the back of your nose and throat, and in severe cases, obviously, also going all the way down to affect the lung. Um, 
and and that is is, is you know it's, of course it's it's much less deadly than Ebola. A mortality rate is is a lot less than than that. Um, but the treacherous thing is that you can have uh, infection with SARS-CoV-2 with the coronavirus without showing any signs of illness. So you can feel perfectly well, but you are infected and maybe passing it on. Let's briefly talk about transmission of the disease, comparing Ebola to SARS-CoV-2. Maybe to just make clear once again, it is much more difficult, right, to transmit Ebola from one human being to another than SARS-CoV-2. Yes, that's absolutely right. So sitting next to somebody um, would not uh, transmit the infection, but it would, of course, with, with the coronavirus. Um, so for Ebola, you really have to be exposed to the body fluids uh, of the patient. Thank, Thank you, bro. Better. In Colombia, one teacher went well beyond the call of duty to bring books to children during the pandemic. Luis Soriano took a mobile library to remote corners of the country, traveling by donkey. Riding his donkey Alpha, Luis Soriano is on his way to today's appointment at the Divino Niño Elementary School in the Department of Magdalena in Colombia. The teacher has loaded his faithful companion with books from his library. He believes that delivering books to school children is an effective way of fighting social inequality. Rural education in Colombia is in bad shape. It needs more support from the state for teachers. Biblioboro was born out of sheer necessity. Teachers lack resources, especially here in the Department of Magdalena, which is one of the most disadvantaged in the country. We need to combat ignorance through reading. What is going to help the future population is reading. Luis Soriano continued to bring his books to the region even during the pandemic, defying the restrictions on movement that were put in place to help stop the spread of COVID. He refused to put his mission on hold. Personally, it was a challenge because my family thought I was putting myself at risk. At one point, I was detained by the police because I shouldn't have been on the street. But knowing the loneliness that exists in the countryside, I felt that moral duty. To keep being able to deliver his books and avoid spreading COVID, he used old farmyard cages as mailboxes. He called his plan Catch a Read. When we started Catch a Read, the kids guarded the cages and waited impatiently for me to come by. I told them that they could only take the book out of the cage after an hour, but they couldn't wait that long. They went and got it after only five minutes. Well, thank God nothing happened, and I'm sure they were always hoping to actually meet again. In Colombia's remote municipalities, books are simply too expensive for people to buy. The few books that reach Sofia's hands have all been brought here by Luis Soriano. Another of his regulars is Luis Fernando. He's the first in his family to learn to read. He asked for books with pictures so that his parents could follow what he was reading. No matter how sad you are, he always makes you smile with his books. He always motivated us to read. Other kids have started reading now too. Whenever he comes to our house, we have something to read. For teachers in the region, the Biblioburo visits, both during and after the pandemic, have been the best way to ensure their students stay motivated and keep discovering new books. The books we get from school are the only books we have. When we read a book, it motivates us to read a new one. But if we just have the same ones as last year, the kids already know them. So what then? We don't even have internet here. Luis Soriano has also built a public library for the school children and their neighbors.
The Biblioborough goes to places that tend to be neglected, where people are forgotten, because these are people who deserve respect, who need to be helped, and whose imaginations need to be nurtured. Luis Soriano is almost like a character out of a Gabriel Garcia Marquez novel, a man who takes books to remote corners of Colombia by donkey, and not even a pandemic can stop him. That was this week's COVID-19 special. Until next time, goodbye.